speaker is our first uh, guest speaker from out of town, so I'd like to express a great thank you for your travels today. Um, Dr. Liza Marie Johnson is coming to us from St. Jude. She is, um, her history is that she uh, trained at medical school at Tulane, got her MPH and her MD at that time. Residency, she went to Tufts Medical Center in Boston, and fellowship was at St. Jude, where she has stayed for the last 15 years. Um, her training is in hematology, oncology, but with her background, she also did a lot of work with bioethics, and she focuses on leading their ethics, um, uh, their bioethics division, as well as the leader of their hospitalist team. And so please welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Marie Johnson. She'll be talking about ethical ethics in pediatrics. Ethical ethics. Ethical ethics. Good morning, everyone. I realize I'm like standing between y'all and lunch. Um, so, and I'm the like one thing that's not like the others. Um, so this talk is sort of to kind of can bridge general pediatrics and pediatric hemonc. Um, oh, this the slide changed. So I have a disclosure. I never thought I'd have one, but uh, a pharmaceutical company paid me some money last year to give ethical advice about the design of a clinical trial. So um, I have a relevant conflict of interest for the first time ever. Um, so the objective of today's talk will be just to remind everyone some basic principles of bioethics, um, recognizing that we sometimes disagree with our patients and families. We'll do um, an introduction to two cases, Jack and Yasser. They're actual, cons uh, actual cases. The names and some of the details have been changed. Um, how I kind of approach complex cases when we have an ethics consult or a conflict with families. Um, some strategies for communication that I think are applicable in your general pediatric setting or in Hemonc. And then wrap up. And you know, I was hoping to have a little bit of time for discussion in case people have like a case or a situation that's like keeping them up at night. Um, but kind of the first thing I, I think just to name is that having conflict with our patients and families can be challenging to us and sort of medical teams or clinics. Like, you know, kind of like I'm sure we've all had days where we just want to like scream and we're in the car and we're like, oh my God, or we walk out of an exam room and we're like, oh, I'm going to count to 10 before I go back in there, right? Um, so like that sort of just happens. And I think sometimes we feel like we're between a rock and a hard place um, and we're not sort of sure what sort of but what to do, you know? Often, it's not like a huge clash of ethical principles. It's sort of like a difference of perspective and communication. When I do an ethics consult, so there's like a lot of mediation that's involved. Um, but sort of quickly, we'll review the four basic principles of bioethics. We've all sort of probably had an ethics class in medical school. Um, you know, it's a tiny component on the pediatric boards. So autonomy, which is respect for persons, you know, it's a respecting a patient or individual's right to self-determination and make their own decisions. Beneficence is maximizing the benefits of a therapy. Non-maleficence is to minimize harms. Um, justice is ensuring fair and equitable kind of treatment for all. I think everyone kind of thinks of those as the four core principles of bioethics. I like to remind people about confidentiality, right, holding sensitive information in confidence. Fidelity is doing what you say you're going to do. You know, that's sort of one way not to be trustworthy is to tell families or patients one thing and to do something else. I mean, certainly sometimes things change, but communicating why that is the case. And veracity is truth-telling. And so um, I think it's important to remember all seven of those. And then thinking about decision-making considerations in pediatrics, what might be different than sort of adult decision-making is that we have a general respect for parental authority. Um, I guess like raise your hand if you're a parent, right? So a lot of us have kids. Like we sort of think that we should make, be able to have, make decisions on their behalf. Um, we know them well, we know what's good for our family. Um, so we sort of respect that parents are decision-makers for children. We also remember that it can be a triad, right? That children do have an opinion um, in their medical care sometimes. There's something in bioethics, and I think it actually was in a Tennessee uh, Supreme Court case once upon a time, called the Rule of Sevens, and it's kind of from like birth through age seven. You know, you don't really expect the child to participate from seven to 13. They have an increasing amount of per uh, participation, and then you're gonna ask sort of their opinion if they're 13 and above. I just say that age is definitely just a number. We certainly see immature 16-year-olds just finding out that they have been diagnosed with cancer. And then you have a nine-year-old who uh, was diagnosed with leukemia when they were three, and they've had a bone marrow transplant, and they like, you know, and like they have plenty of opinions and things to say, even though they're young. Um, and so then I think the next thing to remember that's important in bioethics is we always talk about risks and benefits, but you know, how do we, what are some standards of decision making for those? And so a common one many people have heard of is 
the best interest standard. It's in the it's in a patient's best interest to have this therapy. It's in a patient's best interest to take a flu have the flu shot. The problem with best interest is it's subjective. Um, and you know, if anyone has ever been in a relationship, you know, you and your partner may sometimes have a different definition of what's in one's best interest for weekend plans, right? If you have children, what your teenager thinks is their best interest. Um, for sort of the weekend, it might be different than what you want to do for best interest. If you have multiple children, you may be prioritizing the interest of one child over the other child. And so you can sort of go on and on to see this is sort of an imperfect standard because of its subjectivity. Another sort of standard that's used is a reasonable person standard. What would a reasonable person do in this situation? Um, again, there can be a wide vari variability in what reasonable people do or would choose to sort of do for something. Um, and then another standard that's in pediatrics, um, Doug Dikema put this out in the early 90s. He's a bioethicist and pediatric ER doctor at Seattle Children's, and it's um, stood the test of time. It's the harm principle. And the harm principle is really something that you could have in your pocket when you are considering referral to you know, getting a court order, um, depending on your state, Child Protective Services, Department of Children and Family Services. I always get confused about what Tennessee calls theirs, but you're trying to decide, am I going to make sort of a referral for med medical neglect? And so as we quickly go through these criteria, I want you to think of two examples in your mind. So um, parental refusal of sort of say the seasonal influenza vaccine or parental vaccine refusal of vaccines more broadly, and then parental refusal of a treatment um, for a condition that's relatively treatable. So earlier today, we saw the success rates of, for low-risk Hodgkin's, so a teenager with uh, low-risk Hodgkin's if the parents wanted to, I don't know, drink tea and alkaline water instead of have chemotherapy or radiation, or you know, an infant with a TE fistula that was easily repaired. So you think of a parent refusing either sort of an intervention for one of those two things. And so this is how, you, how the, and there's certainly shades of gray where this is, can be imperfect, but so by refusing to consent to your recommended therapy, are the parents placing their children at significant risk of serious harm, right? So saying no to the flu vaccine is not a significant risk of serious harm whereas the other sort of situation it would be. Is the harm imminent, requiring immediate action to prevent it? So do you have to make a decision or intervene right now to sort of prevent the harm that's coming to the child? Um, is the intervention that the parents are refusing necessary to prevent the serious harm? So refusing chemotherapy or you know, refusing treatment for low-risk leukemia, um, yes, you need, I mean, you need that to prevent the harm of untreated leukemia. Um, is the intervention that has been refused of proven efficacy and therefore likely to prevent the harm. And I think this, you know, in children who have a poor, really poor prognosis if their family refuses treatment, you know, something that comes to mind might be a DIPG, which is a type of brain tumor that's essentially incurable. Um, you know, really poor prognosis, and then there's really good prognosis, you sort of know what to do. Proven efficacy is, you know, gets challenging when you have cases where, you know, the survival of treatment is 50%, 60%, 40%. Um, that sort of, you know, if you're getting a court order, you know, that's subjective of what proven efficacy is. So number five is, does the intervention that has been refused by parents not also place the child at significant risk of serious harm? And did the projected benefits outweigh the projected burdens more favorably than the option chosen by the parents? And we're gonna go through something a little bit later on that sort of like helps work through this in a more practical way. Then the question is, would any other option prevent the serious harm to the child in a way that is less intrusive to parental autonomy and more acceptable to the parents, right? So it gets to that perfect is the enemy of the good. Is there something that's good enough? Yes. Is this, you know, in our HEMONC world, is this frontline therapy, you know, or this new standard of care, you know, that, you know, the event free survival is 75 percent. With the old treatment, it was only 55 to 60 percent, but the parents are willing to sort of take this other treatment because it's less likely to require a blood transfusion, you know, in the case of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. And so kind of trying to think through, is there something else we can do that's kind of like good enough that is still acceptable and has a reasonable chance of benefit? 
And then can state intervention be generalized to other similar situations? And then finally, would most parents agree that state intervention is reasonable? So most parents wouldn't agree that calling CPS for vaccine refusal is like a reasonable thing, I would think, right? They would feel like that falls into the scope of parental autonomy. So the harm principle just kind of helps you when a parent really disagrees with your recommended therapy to say, is this like rising to the level of medical neglect? How can I sort of think through it? And so thinking about um, bioethics and, you know, what are our responsibilities to parents? And I think we have to respect them for persons and for our autonomy. We, you know, we all often talk about consent, but when you're, you can only consent for yourself, technically, in like legal terms. So parents provide informed permission. So we respect their role as decision makers. We try to support you know, what their family goals, values, hopes, and beliefs are for their child that's in our care. And we try to provide it, we should provide accurate information and realistic options. If something isn't realistic, don't mention it, and then be um, upset when the family chooses the unrealistic option. Um, you know, maybe not in the general pediatric setting, but sometimes in the inpatient setting. You know, people hear about something, and if they hear about it, they think, well, the doctor mentioned it, so it must be a good idea. And so we, I think we sometimes feel like we have to lay out every single option, but if it's not a good option, like, don't bring it up or bring it up in the context of why this is not a good, you may have heard about dialysis. It's not right for your child because blah, 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 blah. Um, if you really feel like, you know, like it's a very like savvy family and they really want, you want to cover every detail, you could do it sort of that way. Um, what are our responsibilities to the patients, to the children, right? To try to maximize benefits to them and to minimize harms, right? The two ethical principles of beneficence and non-maleficence. We want to try to help them and not harm them and recognizing they may desire or benefit from being included in medical conversations and also the importance of disclosure. You know, from time to time, people don't want to disclose their child's cancer diagnosis to them. You know, that's usually something that's doesn't come to me as ethics because the, our teams and child life are able to work through with families about why um, not being transparent can be harmful. It's like also like, you know, like in here, you know, you're like oncology ward, mom, what's, what's oncology? <laughs> you know, um, kids are going to figure out that they have cancer as it turns out. Um, and so, you know, these sort of can come up when people refuse a recommended medical therapy, when families are demanding medically non-beneficial interventions, um, when we're trying to recognize that families have cultural practices outside of our own, which may influence their healthcare decision making. And then we also have to remember what are our responsibilities to the team, right? Because people come with their own beliefs, biases, and values. And so just because, uh, you know, we had a consult recently or a case recently um, of a child with um, I don't even remember, like some terribly metastatic relapsed cancer refractory to like blue, which like progressing through all sorts of chemo. And you know, our inpatient attending, you know, wanted to go over the scans with the family that showed like tremendous tr disease uh, progression. Um, but the primary oncologist was like, no, no, I'll just try this other course of chemotherapy for them, right? And so there was like a lot of distress for the nurses, right? And even for the primary oncologist, or not the primary, the inpatient oncologist was like, why would you ever offer this family, you know, this this is an option. This child is like days to weeks to live. Um, and so recommend, recognizing that while we think something is okay, thinking about the greater team and making space for people to sort of like voice their concerns. Um, so now, when we do disagree, some thoughts about it. Um, but first, we're gonna um, play a little. We're gonna have a little exercise. It's a little fun game. I'm going to say a word, and like when I say that word, something. I don't know if you guys have seen the slides. Hopefully not. Makes it less fun. Um, I'm gonna say a word, and then um, you're gonna think of something when I say this word. And then I'm gonna we're gonna do pull the room about sort of what the word made you think. Ready for the word? Orange. So how many people thought of the fruit? How many people thought of the color? Mm, the fruit, much more popular. Maybe we had, there was orange juice this morning. <laughs> um, so I just say that it's fun because when we think about what we say to, so like what we say to families and what it means to them, like the precision of our words matter. So like orange is just a simple example, right? Um, connotation and denotation. Denotation is the dictionary definition of the word, um, but connotation is the feeling evoked by the word. So like on this slide, the sort of, like I typed in orange on like an Instagram story, and these are the things that came up, like slices of fruit, some orange squiggle. So like even then color and fruit, like apparently, you know, AI thinks there's more things associated with orange. And just an example, like when I say cat, 
Maybe you think of this cute furry kitten. Maybe you think of like a cheetah at the zoo. And so simple words that seem so simple can have such different meaning um, for families. And I think, you know, in children who are really ill, um, you know, with like multi-system organ failure that we don't expect to survive hospital discharge. And uh, I don't know why I'm picking on nephrologists today, but the nephrologist comes in and it's like, the kidneys are doing better. I mean, it could be the pulmonologist. Like the, you know, the vent settings went down and it's like, well, the kidneys are better, but like the lungs are worse. And so, you know, the kid is not actually improved when you sort of do net net. And so words matter. So, you know, you may have families who are very close to you and who reach out to you for advice while their child is hospitalized. And so, you know, I'm just thinking about the words you say can have like tremendous sort of implications. Um, I was involved in an ethics consult on a child who was presumably brain dead, but the family was refusing um, the brain death exam. And uh, the child had been too stable, to, unstable to go for repeat imaging. And then was there was like a window where people really wanted an MRI or the flow scan, but they like did a repeat CT scan. And the intensivist covering on the weekend said to the mom, after the, she did great. And you know, this is on a Saturday, and on Friday, I'm like, your child is critically ill and too unstable to lay flat for an MRI, and like, this is why we're concerned. And then, like, the mom lost, she lost trust in a lot of people, but she really lost trust in me, right? Because, I mean, that intensivist was just trying to provide some reassurance, but like, you know, in the sort of context of the bigger thing, you know, the mom kind of latched on to that, that other people were not being truthful with her. Um, so I just think we need to remember that individual perspectives can influence parental beliefs and values and even sort of our own. And for those in the back of the room, you know, the, it may be hard to read the boxes in the, on the left, but it's a glass of water that's half full and one fish is like face down and one is fa face up and the, the one that's out of the water is like, whoa, half empty, definitely half empty. And the guy who's like swimming around in the water was like, just listen to you, you're such a pessimist, right? And so it just shows that perspective is um, is everything. And like I can see both the four and the three, right? So you can see it just kind of what side of the coin that you're on. And so it gets back to this best interest or what a reasonable person would do. It's like, you know, what is best? And you know, you know, what is water? It's like, it's subjective. Other reasons for conflict are how we perceive a situation. Um, miscommunication sometimes. So for those in the back, the person's drowning and the guy's like, soap, you need soap? So, um, and then I think in sort of uh, this day and age, mistrust or misinformation, um, you know, I put all the social media things because I don't know, but it, like, I follow this person on social media who says that you should drink alkaline water and it'll like change your pH and cure the cancer. And you're like, mm, no, nah, it's probably not, just that's probably not gonna be helpful. Um, it, but they have two million followers. It's been shared this many times, right? And so you as an individual are like competing with likes and followers and sort of people who are influential. And so it's just, um, you know, kind of knowing where you're, where the conflict is coming from or what's sort of behind people's beliefs is helpful. So in healthcare, what are some potential sources of conflict we have with families? Prognostic, prognostic uncertainty, right? So we're not exactly sure how well someone is going to do. You know, like I think medicine is not black and white. There's a lot of gray. You know, two similarly situated patients respond to therapy differently. Um, and so people really want it to be black and white, and it's just not. And then conflict over decisions to withhold or withdraw artificial life-sustaining medical therapies. Some people may perceive a child as being undertreated or overtreated. Maybe conflicts over a code status. Sometimes families want more time, either to make the decision about what's being offered or um, more time with their child um, before they're willing to accept that you know, their child is going to die. Maybe they want more family to come, but this is sort of why the th theme of the talk is understanding the why, is trying to make space to, to figure out a little bit more about this. Sometimes families refuse our recommended therapy. Um, people can be distressed about perceptions of untreated, undertreated, or refractory pain. I think we see now sometimes, um, you know, the opioid crisis and people you know, fearing addiction, families or parents can be averse to sort of pain medications for their child, um, thinking that they're going to become an addict. Um, at our institution, sometimes we, I hear, but we treated the cancer, we can't stop now. It's like, well, they don't have leukemia anymore. You know, they've had their, you know, their sort of 
200 days out, you know, from their bone marrow transplant and their MRD, which is the, you know, marker of residual disease is negative. And you're like, mm, but their kidneys and lungs don't work anymore. And so, but people don't want to give up because they don't sort of have the primary disease that they had. Um, there can be conflicts over resource allocation, you know, should this child get this last ECMO circuit? Um, is this child a good candidate for bone marrow transplant? Um, I had an ethics consult a few months ago on a very complex infant with trisomy 18 and hepatoblastoma and 19 other medical problems, such as a congenital diaphragmatic hernia, severe pulmonary hypertension, an unrepairable VSD. Um, and the question was like, you know, should we be giving this infant you know, single agent cisplatin for their hepatoblastoma, given, you know, all of these other sort of problems and like taking up this NICU bed. Um, treatment disparities, cultural, religious value conflicts, bad behavior by family or staff, you know, um, not every family or parent is likable. Um, not everyone was sort of raised to be a good patient or a good parent and come into their appointments on time and be grateful and know appropriate language to use when they are sort of frustrated and express emotion. Um, and then just kind of like the last source of conflict is trying to understand what it means to be a good parent. We had a study out of St. Jude a really long time ago um, that asked parents or interviewed parents whose children were offered a phase one oncology trial. And there were families who um, wanted to leave no stone unturned, right? So their definition of being a good parent was doing every single thing they could to save their child. And others who prioritized quality of life a little bit more. And so trying to get into those good parent beliefs can be very helpful. And so I think the situations that really challenge us are when people refuse our recommendation um, and it's for something that's sort of treatable or, or preventable or who, when they demand likely non-beneficial therapies. You know, I there was an ethics consult years ago for a child with um, renal medullary carcinoma and uh, it was an adolescent. And the surgeon was like, I'm probably not gonna have any complications when I take out this kidney, but I cannot let a pediatric patient die in the operating room on the table in front of me because I could not transfuse them. You know, the family was Jehovah's Witness. So like there are, um, you know, really it's sort of a challenge, can challenge our beliefs and values to honor sort of the, the beliefs and values of other um, others. So now I'll tell you about Jack. So Jack was a four-year-old with a localized recurrence of alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. He had previously been treated with surgical resection and 40 weeks of chemotherapy. Um, when his tumor recurred locally, um, it, um, there was microscopic disease present you know, on the edges, but negative lymph nodes and no evidence of sort of metastatic disease. He underwent two cycles of chemotherapy for his relapsed disease. Um, his first course, he had constipation. One of the medications he received, uh, vincristine, was sort of, that's a side, known side effect. And um, the primary team was seeking to avoid that problem with his second course of chemotherapy, so they put him on an aggressive bowel regimen, and then he developed diarrhea. Um, so they were just maybe too successful in their attempts at preventing constipation. But the family said, no, that's enough. We don't want any chemotherapy, we don't want radiation. This treatment is too impactful on his quality of life. No more, we're done. Ding, ding, ring, 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 Liza, can you come help? So how do you sort of think through an ethics consult? There's commonly something um, by Johnson, Siegler, and Winslet um, about this four box me method. So for an individual case, what are the medical indications? What are the patient and family preferences? What about, are there quality of life implications? And are there any contextual features? And the contextual features are sort of the details that might make two cases um, a little bit different. And so the medical indications, so historically, since most of you are not oncologists, the five-year event-free survival for patients with relapsed alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma was believed to only be 10%, right? So we'd maybe only save one out of 10 children. There was a paper that had just come out that demonstrated that patients with localized relapse have an event-free survival of, from the paper 54% plus or minus 20. So as good as 75%, it's bad as like 25%, right? So, you know, that's not particularly specific range. Um, so the team believes there's a good chance for cure and therapy should not be discontinued. They feel that the treatment plan of chemo and radiation are not unduly toxic and do not sort of negatively impact quality of life. The family, however, feel that chemo and radiation are very toxic. They believe that there is no solid evidence that the treatment plan will cure their son 
you know, when asked what they believe the actual chance of cure to be, they said closer to 30%. The team had given the, the family the paper, and the mom was like, I read that paper. She was like, there was like only one kid like near my kid's age in the sample. Like, I don't think the paper represents my child. And I was like, oh, okay, fair. Um, she believes, the mom, when I'm meeting with her, that diet changes and natural immune boosters and homeopathic treatments will cure him if he is meant to be cured. Because they believe in God, have a strong belief in their faith, and they believe in prayer, and that God does not need chemotherapy to heal their child. They are now skeptical of medical research. The mom told me, you know, when he was diagnosed, it's like, it's so overwhelming, your child has cancer, it's like being on a roller coaster, you know, we just were like on the ride, right? Like we just like were holding on and didn't know we were on, getting on a roller coaster. She's like, but now we know better. We have experience, you know, we've done our research. We just really sort of disagree. They say they want to maximize Jack's quality of life for the time he has left if he is terminal. They feel that the chemo and radiation will worsen his quality of life. You know, they cited that, you know, the nausea, vomiting, and weight loss that were associated with his courses of chemotherapy they said he was sleeping 18 to 20 hours a day and couldn't play and sort of saw it really being negative on him. So they thought that the treatment plan only exposed Jack to suffering and was stealing whatever quality of life he had left if he was not going to be cured through prayer and natural remedies. The medical team also prioritizes his quality of life. They say the symptoms are manageable and the recommended medical therapy offers a reasonable chance of cure. So kind of the contextual features, you know, the team feels the mom is making an unreasonable choice. The family feels they are choosing in Jack's best interest. Religious and health beliefs are guiding their views on medicine. The medical data has a large degree of uncertainty. You know, the mom said to me, if this is forced upon me, who will be responsible for my child's suffering? If he suffers and does not survive, who is going to take responsibility for that suffering? I am at home with him all the time. Who will be responsible for his suffering, Dr. Johnson? And I'm like, hmm, excellent point. And so this would not meet the criteria for medical neglect, right? If we went through that sort of harm principle per se, you know, right? Like, is the treatment, you know, it's like maybe a three, you know, like maybe three and four are cured, maybe only one in, one in four. Um, you know, it has sort of side effects. You know, the thing about sort of court orders or referrals in the oncology space is it really is up to the judge you know, and sort of like, you know, it's very subjective and sort of the outcomes are sort of all over the place. Referral, you know, when often, you know, when we refer in oncology to CPS, Child Protective Services, you know, they're like, oh, the kid's fine right now. They don't really quite see the immediate harm necessarily. Um, and part of it is they are certainly overburdened with children who are at risk of immediate harm from like physical violence or guns or drugs in the house that they have access to. Um, and so often, um, unless the child has an overt relapse or some sort of progression, they're not going to intervene when you have this degree of uncertainty. So now I'll tell you about Yasser. Don't worry, we'll find out more about Jack later on. <laughs> um, so Jack is a 16-year-old male from Lebanon who has come to America with his mom and older brother for a bone marrow transplant. He has relapsed ALL. He's now 22 days after an unrelated donor transplant in our ICU. Critically ill with multi-system organ failure, uncontrolled bacteremia that is not responding to antibiotics. He is intubated, paralyzed, sedated, and no one expects him to survive to hospital discharge. The mother speaks only Arabic. The brother communicates well in English and frequently relays information to the mother. The family, including the mother, usually decline a medical interpreter. Our pharmacist is fluent in Arabic, and so she hears the conversations that the brother has with his mother, and there are concerns that he is not being completely transparent about Yasser's condition. The transplant attending goes in to meet with the brother, um, and uh, so the mother has kind of deferred most medical decision making informally to the brother. I think in the, you know, culturally, the male is the head of the household, is, tends to be the one who makes decisions in, in their, in, the, that individual family's culture, I realize that's not true of all Muslim culture, but in, for this family it was. Um, and so the mother had generally deferred to her son, the older brother, to make medical decisions. And so the transplant attendant comes out and says that um, the, he's requested that the team do everything to help Yasser. He says he wants to tell their family back home that everything was done to save his brother's life. Um, the medical team feels CPR would inflict harm with no benefit except prolonging suffering and dying. Like he was extremely coagulopathic. 
Um, people did not really feel that pressing on his chest was going to offer any benefit. Um, okay, so, you know, these are like, I'm in my line at Starbucks and I like check my email and they're like, hey Liza, can you come up to the ICU? So like, yeah, and you're like you know, while I'm waiting to get my caffeine, I'll tell you about how I sort of think through things. So one, I sort of think about a shared de decision making, I think, most parents and families, when they refuse or demand, are not trying to harm their child. They are requesting that, that what they believe is best for their child, right? And so if we disagree, like what are our common points and how can we share information? So working to build consensus, try to reach an agreement, um, getting informed permission, you know, we're trying to combine perspectives. Um, there is a role in parental refusals about prognosis. Um, this is from a, a paper about adult decision-making, surrogates, making adults making decisions for adults. Um, but I always liked the paper, and so I think when there's a pretty good outcome, the parent or guardian probably can't refuse, right? So you can't refuse treatment for lower standard risk, ALL, upfront at diagnosis, or Hodgkin's disease. Like, that's kind of an easy sort of thing. Um, you know, we've had cases, severe aplastic anemia, family's Jehovah's Witness, you know, we're gonna try pretty damn hard not to give you blood or platelets, but there comes a point where like, we can't let your child, your toddler die because we did not give them a platelet transfusion and their platelet count is three and they have a bleed. Um, in cases where the poor outcome, the parent or guardian may refuse and that's reasonable. Um, and then, you know, it's these cases in the middle that can get tricky. And so I think um, what has helped me in these cases where the medical team and the family are in disagreement is knowing the why behind a family's decision. So there's three um, different examples here from real cases. Um, we had a grandmother who was serving in loco parentis, so that means you can make decision in place of the parents. The mother had anxiety disorder and didn't come to the hospital, so the grandmother was at the bedside, and she was refusing um, oral medications that the nurses were bringing into the child's room. And so I get this call, well, can grandmother do this? You know, we can't reach the mom, the mom's not coming to the hospital, like, does she have capacity? Why is she refusing? So I went and talked to this mom, this grandmother, a sweet little old lady, um, who didn't really want to talk to me, because she could tell, like, that people were talking about her at the nurse's station as being difficult, and, you know, the tr trust was really broken, but I hung in there, and I talked to her for a little while. And this was a, ch a little boy or girl who had been in the ICU um, with, uh, like, uh, severe colitis and pancreatitis as complications of le leukemia therapy. And the surgeon was like, if this is NPO and this doesn't work, like, we may have to take out a portion of your grandson's intestines. He improved, came to the floor, he still had a strict NPO sign on the door. So the grandmother felt like she was advocating for him because if he's strictly NPO, why are you coming in and bringing medications, right? He was NPO except meds, there had been a change. But no one had communicated that to her. And she had had a family member who had almost died from a medical error, right? So she was, her job or who, her duty was like to be uh, vigilant and to look out for potential medical errors. And so that is just a miscommunication, sort of trying to know the why, you know, behind um, her decision making was helpful. And we were able to talk through why the medication was okay per mouth um, and kind of resolved everything. The top right is um, examples of some fabulous books you can buy on Amazon. Um, you know, you can cure cancer at home for like, I can't read this, 515 a day. Um, medicine is like everything that the doctors aren't telling you. Um, it now has more ratings, still five stars. Um, the, I will tell you, Jack's mom had read this book and was communicating with the author of this book who refused to, um, we offered to chat with him and he refused. And so I think the hard thing about Jack's case was part of her intentions were correct, but she was getting bad information. Right? And there's no accountability for someone on social media who, who writes a book, you know, when they give in a, inappropriate medical information. And then the example in the middle is um, we had a toddler with a rare tumor that is not chemosensitive on their forearm, and the team was recommending radiation, and the family was refusing and demanding a amputation. And so I called the mom at home, and I was like, hey, so I'm Dr. Johnson. I'm a he mocked doctor, but I do ethics, and I'm just here to under, I'm trying to understand better. And um, 
I learned from talking to her that they had two traumatic amputations in their extended family, like someone sticking their arm out the window, and then I don't remember what the other one was. And she, so the, she was told that the risk of radiation on this two-year-old was a, like that the arm wouldn't grow properly, right? That the arm might be smaller and deformed. And so she kept talking about an infant hand. I don't want my baby to have an infant hand. I don't want him to have an infant hand. I'd rather that he had a prosthetic arm. Because they had two family members that had prosthetic arms, and that was normal to them. And so it was like, you know, like, who? It's weird, who would know that? But, um, but it was asking the why, like why are you so afraid of, you know, like why, why, tell me why you think amputation would be better than radiation. You know, it's establishing trust and trying to understand the why that underlies someone's decision. Don't worry, we did not amputate the arm. The mom agreed to radiation. <laughs> um, so a little bit about shared decision making is, you know, really trying to sort of honor the family wishes and think is what is medically reasonable? How can I think outside the box? We published a paper last year. There, um, there have been some cases published in adults, um, but this was the first pediatric case. Granted, it was a teenager, so she was kind of like a small adult. Um, she had relapsed Hodgkin's disease and had come from Mexico and was a Jehovah's Witness. And we ended up, the question was whether to leave her on this kind of immunotherapy thing, but, but for how long, or to do um, an auto transplant. And the family very much wanted the auto transplant, but they did not want any blood products. We were like, that is going to be a challenge. Um, but we ended up getting her through an auto transplant with no blood or platelets. We did give her a clot on her pick, probably trying to address the thrombocytopenia. But um, you know, I think that what is reasonable and what are you sort of willing to try? Um, but this is a great thing that can be maybe useful to sort of how we think about decision making. Um, so this was published as a supplement in pediatrics. And then the, on the next slide, there's um, an updated paper also came out. Um, and I recommend maybe the updated one, but both are good. So this is out of the Seattle Children's Center for Bioethics group again. And so it's kind of like, does the decision include more than one medically reasonable option, yes or no? If not, shared decision-making is probably not indicated. But if yes, you go down. Does one of the options have a more favorable you know, medical benefit burden ratio compared to the others, right? Is there a preferred option? Um, yes or no. If there is a preferred option, I mean, it's not like, would you like antibiotic A or antibiotic B, right, for your otitis media? Like, you know, maybe there's like, those are, might be kind of equal. Um, but if there's one that's like a, clearly a better option, um, then it's more clinician guided. And then if they're relatively equivalent, that's maybe more parent guided. And then down in step three, it's how preference sensitive are the options. And so if the parents have a high preference, then it's maybe, although you're on the clinician guided, the gray side, it might be less clinician guided. Um, you know, if the parental preference is low, it, you, then it may be more clinician guided. And then similarly, if you've gone down the, you know, you know, the options are relatively equal and you're in the parent box in the blue and the parents have a high preference, then it's more parent guided. And then if it's low preference, it's a little bit less parent guided. It's kind of like a busy thing when you first time you see it, but the like more you kind of work through it, it works out. And then this is the updated paper that came out in Pediatric Clinics of North America um, about in a chapter about shared decision making. Um, so it's unfortunate there's not a pointer, but so that we'll look to the side on the right. And so this is a parent who disagrees with medically reasonable options. Um, so if you kind of go, hold on this up. The, it says the parent insists on the medically unreasonable option. So if what the parent is insisting on is not efficacious, but not harmful, you can tolerate it or you can decline to comply, right? Like you don't have to write the prescription. Um, if it's not efficacious and it's potentially harmful, you're kind of like, I can decline to comply. I can discourage it, right? Because it's potentially harmful. Um, and if it's really harmful, then you might need to contact state authorities. Um, and so the other sort of right side of the right side of the figure, um, when the parent is declining medically reasonable options, you know, it, it gets back to that harm principle, those sort of eight questions we asked at the beginning of the talk. 
and sort of you meet the conditions of the harm principle, it's yes, you contact state authorities. And if it doesn't meet the conditions, you try to respectfully work with a family to optimize the care of the child, you know, and that can be hard. Um, but, you know, we see lots of children, we have lots of experience, this is their own child. And like I said, people generally feel like they're making the best decision. Certainly there are parents who have pathology who don't, but most believe that they're making the right decision for their child. So I think some strategies for communication is, um, gets back to that, principle of veracity, um, but you should do it kindly. You know, if you sort of come in, like, you know, 100 miles an hour, you come in hot, you know, with like, this is what we're doing, or this is like, you know, you know, your child has, I don't know, this terrible prognosis, and like, you know, there's no sort of trust building or rapport or anything. So you tell the truth, but tell it slant. So I just kind of like this Emily Dickinson quote for that reason. And then I think leaning into your communication. So if you just look, if you ignore the words on the right and you look at the image on the left, when I first saw this, I love Google image, by the way, when I try to put talks together. When I first came across this, I don't even remember what I was searching. I literally thought this was a wolf trying to eat that child. <laughs> I was like, and the mom's like, no, not my baby. And then I read the title of the piece, which is a St. Bernard dogs comes to the aid of a lost woman with a sick child. And so if you just think about what your sort of framing is and how just like a little bit, right? Like the now I know what the painter was thinking. And I'm like, oh, I guess there's a thing around that dog's neck, you know, like a little sort of medicine around his neck. Um, and so I just think it's like how we communicate and how we're sort of perceived um, are important. So language matters. If there's not really a choice, don't offer a choice and be like, you can do A or B. Oh, you picked B? No, actually, we're just going to do, do A, right? I think we... You know, this particular um, family that I was sharing with where the, the inpatient oncologist had a conflict with the primary oncologist, she was like, well, I've told them the risks and benefits and that their child has terrible disease. It was like a pelvic rhabdo myosarcoma that was all over the abdomen and lungs and everywhere. Um, but they want this whatever phase one thing or this like, you know, I'm like, they want it because you mentioned it to them. like. They work in a factory. I don't think they like found this weird third line therapy that like most oncologists who don't specialize in this type of tumor know about. Like I don't think they, you know, knew about that. Like it was presented on your list of sort of things, and like you think it's a reasonable option, but all these other people are like, mm, it's probably not a reasonable option. Um, so try to present things that are reasonable, helpful that won't harmful, likely to achieve the goals, offer guidance, utilize resources, give recommendations, and comfort and support. This um, table I love, it's from a paper about unilateral do not resuscitate orders, but I think it has a lot of great communication strategies, especially if you're meeting a family for the first time, you know, your colleagues out, you're covering, or you know, you're coming on for the HEMOC people in the world, you're like coming on service, um, and things are, stress levels are high with the family, you know, it's like tell us about your child before he or she became ill, what was important to him, what was important to you and your family and your quality of life. You know, asking people to share their understanding of their child's illness. You know, I've had parents say, You've t I understand you don't think that my child will survive, but you don't need to tell me that every single day after rounds. I get it. I just choose to hope that they will improve from the ICU. Like, stop. You know, like, I hear you. Like, stop. So, but if you can ask people to sort of, vocalize their understanding. It also shows like the gaps, right, where you have that miscommunication or misperception. Um, you know, this question, if you guys have access to palliative care, what do you think, what are your hopes? And you're hoping for a miracle, I'm hoping for a cure. What else are you hoping for? Um, and just trying to sort of explore, you know, we hope your child will get her, but I'm very worried that our treatments will not be successful. I said to a mom once, I said, I know, you're aware that we all just met as a team, a medical team for a couple of hours. This may be hard for you to hear, but would you be surprised to know that none of us expect your child to survive the, the hospital alive? And she like took a breath. I mean, we knew each other for a long time. Um, and she said, do I need to call my husband? This was like a family that was not local to Memphis. And I said, no, I said, I was like, we'll make up a name. Sam, um, Sam is, you know, has been very ill. He's been in the ICU for three months now. 
he keeps having these problems and we keep fixing them. But it's like a dam. You know, you keep patching the dam, and the, but eventually the dam has enough like patches that the dam is just gonna like give way and you can't fix the dam. And I'm sorry to say that like we think that one of these leaks is like for Sam, it's like the dam is going to like burst open. You know, we, none of us expect Sam to leave the hospital. And I know that's hard to hear. I was like, so there's something that's important for you and your other children. You know, you don't have to call your husband. I don't like, I'm not expecting the dam to break tonight but the dam is probably going to break. And so you, you know, and I think that changed her decision-making calculus and that child didn't, died about within the next month after she and I had that conversation. And so I think that um, when families ask for everything to be done, you know, we need to stop saying do everything or ask what, what, what does everything mean? Assume the family has a good reason to make the request, like avoid labeling them as irrational, like, oh, they're demanding chemotherapy, they're crazy, like they don't get it. Um, try to understand why they're making that request. Um, recognize that requests may be a way to cope with conflicting information about prognosis. It gets back to like, you know, the subspecialist, one organ is improved, the other ones are not, right? Like, we also know that kids who are in the ICU for a long time, right, it can be an undulating course, good days, bad days. And then trying to explore the meaning of do, do everything. Um, so now, I'll tell you how the two cases ended. Um, and so in this, if you can't read it, it says, have a seat, Kermit. What I'm about to come to tell you might come as a big shock. So Kermit's about to learn that, in fact, he is a puppet. Um, <laughs> so for Jack, the family's decision about refusing chemotherapy was honored. It was really hard for the, the patient's fellow had a child the same age as Jack. And um, it was really hard for him to go home at night and look at his own child. Um, and so I will tell you some other information is that the child was enrolled in a study and they were studying his tumor cells in the lab along with other children's tumor cells with rhabdomyosarcoma. And we, so we had data which did not influence the ethics consult, but I think made people feel a little better about the parent's decision um, that it was a pretty aggressive tumor. And like for the agents they were sort of testing, it was like refractory to it. So it, it's probably with chemo, he probably would not, he probably would not have you know, it would have been the lower end um, and more like traditional relapsed alveolar rhabdo. So we recurred one year after cessation of those two cycles of chemo for relapsed disease. He, the family continued to decline chemo and they actually asked for his port to come out. We had left the port in and they had agreed initially when they'd gone off therapy to let the palliative care, like home care team come out and flush it once a month. And then they sort of like had gone AWOL for a while. Um, but once he relapsed, they asked the port to come out and we were like, are you sure you might want it for pain control? But they were adamant, so we took the port out. They did not keep their appointments for a second opinion at Vanderbilt, or I think we also offered Arkansas at Little Rock. Um, and then they were lost to follow up, including the palliative care service who was trying to help them with decision making. Six months later, they returned to the emergency room with gross recurrence and symptoms of pain from like frank tumor progression. They declined palliative directed chemotherapy or radiation, and they continued to use homeopathic agents. They enrolled him in home hospice to manage symptoms as he approached the end of his life. And throughout the whole thing, the family expressed no regrets at all and felt that they had made the right decision for their child. Yasser, uh, turns out that he had a multi-drug resistant E. coli bacteremia. Um, palliative care team went in to explain to the brother why CPR would not be helpful in, in Yasser's case and potentially harmful. And we can certainly talk about the communication issues with the mom. That was a component of it all. Um, and the brother said, of course, I don't want you to do anything that would not benefit Yasser. Please don't do CPR if you don't think that it will help. And it just goes to sort of the framing. You know, the transplant attending had sort of asked, well, do you want us to do everything? And if, like, he was like, yeah, do everything. And so, including CPR? Well, yes, do CPR. You know, so it's like when you sort of explain and you make the link, people generally, you know, I have a paper that I'm working on. We looked at 15 years of inpatient deaths. You know, a lot of what's been published at end of life in pediatric oncology or kids with palliative care involvement. We just looked at everyone who died at St. Jude for the past 15 years um, and looked at medical treatments at the time of death, 24 hours, 48 hours, and seven days prior to death if they were admitted that, you know, long. Because um, you have kids with, like, neutropenia who come in septic and die despite your attempts to save them, unfortunately. Um, and I think we had of 400 or something deaths I think we had two unilateral DNRs, right? And there were family, there was a number of 
families who had not agreed to limitations of therapy or change in code status, but on the last day of their child's life, they saw that their child was dying and they um, were agreeable to not escalate the interventions that their child was receiving. So closing reflections, I think act with fidelity, right? Do what you say you're going to do. Be truthful, but tell it kindly. Know when to just be present for a family. I think we are not good at sitting with silence. You know, try to hold on to your compassion, even with difficult patients and families. Leave room for grace. Be curious about why someone is making the decisions or the requests that they are. I think we have to name them to tame them. We have implicit and explicit biases that impact us as people. We are our people too. And we have emotions that these cases raise in us. And I think it's important to try to reserve judgment and just listen first. I do try to go into an open mind, with an open mind when I meet with families. We often in healthcare talk about mistrust. Oh, this patient is, this racial group historically mistrusts and we talk about mistrust, but we need to, I think, flip that. Think about how can we be trustworthy you know, especially in like the post-COVID era where, you know, some people who maybe didn't have as mistrust, like there was, are now more mistrustful. Um, we have to be trustworthy. It's on us to be trustworthy. And then um, I sort of kind of love this sort of image. Um, I think, you know, even in general pediatrics, like we're always sort of there to sort of be present when a family is going through something emotionally or challenging, you know, it doesn't have to be cancer diagnosis. It can be another devastating diagnosis. It can be a child who's drowned. Um, you know, there can be many, you know, firearm injuries. Um, there's a role to sort of comfort. And I love this picture because, you know, it reminds us of the era before our, all our tests and typing into the computer to write our electronic note when we're visiting with the family. You know, back in the day of house calls, you know, the, if you can't see this well in the back, the mom is by the window with her head down and the father is trying to comfort her and, you know, this, you know, child who's very ill, potentially dying, and the physician is sitting at the child's bedside just being present. And so sometimes there's just a role to sort of sit in the space with families um, and emphasizing, you know, when we're not going to offer something, when families are offering something, to emphasize what care and treatments are being provided. Um, I recognize that sometimes it's probably easier to give the antibiotics for the viral, the Z-Pack for the viral illness. Like the family paid the $25 for the copay and they're convinced that their child needs antibiotics and they waited in the waiting room. Um, and you just maybe want to just, the harm of it, right? So what is that other one about, you know, decline, comply? Um, you're like, I'm just gonna go comply. This is totally useless, but I'm just gonna, I just don't have it in me today. Um, but if you want to decline, you can say or do watchful waiting in case of otitis. Um, you can sort of say, you know, antibiotics aren't indicated for colds or viruses, but what I, we are going to do, right? Because then you can just like pivot away from what you're not, I'm not going to give you a prescription for antibiotics, but what I am going to recommend, right? And sort of doing some like leaning into what, you, you know, you have done. I, you know, uh, you can emphasize, you know, because why do parents bring their child to the pediatrician? They're worried about them, right? And so, so they don't feel like they're wasting your time. You can like lean into what you did on the exam or what your findings are. You know, I have a nine month old and I don't know, a month and a half ago, she probably got RSV, went to a huge holiday party. Um, the amount of snot that she was producing, I was like, hmm, I got sick. I didn't have COVID, so I was like, well, you probably didn't have COVID. Um, so my husband, who's not in medicine, looks at me and um, he's like, so when do we take her to the doctor? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, the good thing is I'm a pediatrician. <laughs> and um, I'm gonna tell you what the doctor's gonna tell you. <laughs> You could pay me the copay. Um, but so anyway, I was like, this is when I would be worried. This is why I'm not worried. I did bring my stethoscope home from work that night. I mean, I will say that I was like, let me just make sure she's moving. I don't care. She looks fine. Um, but so anyway, so you can emphasize, I listen to their lungs. You know, I don't hear anything that makes me concerned for pneumonia. I think this is just a cold virus. I would expect that they have, might have fever for the next, you know, three to five days. You know, it may be a high fever, right? Like all that sort of stuff that we like are sick of the speech because we've given the speech, you know, like you can sort of do that. I am doing this. I did find these things instead of saying like, I'm not giving you antibiotics, like get out of my office. I've got 20 more kids to see, you know, <laughs> in the next hour. Um, Maybe it's not that bad. Um, maybe it is. Um, and so this is my contact information, uh, my email. That's my Twitter, or formerly known as Twitter handle. Um, but feel free to reach out to me. And I'll be around for a few minutes afterwards. Okay.
Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Actually, don't go back to your seat. Would all the morning speakers please come up? We're going to take five minutes to just answer questions um, that the audience might have um, for Drs. Chang, Mitchell, Priola, Swain, Mian, and Johnson. Um, um, thinking about the primary care pediatric environment and screening for anemia, which we do often around the age of one, there's a lot of hemoglobins, and many times the screening, especially if it's a child on Medicaid, we're only getting the hemoglobin back at that first just screening that we're doing based on age. So, and many of them come back in the range of 10 to 11. That's a really common result. And so I'm just curious what your thoughts are about multivitamins with iron as an approach to that rate, it, you know, is it sort of 11 and under or anemic and under is ferrous sulfate dosed by the milligram per kilogram or is there any room for that? And sort of related to that is polyvisol as a strategy in infancy versus again, sort of a, you know, because that comes up all the time. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question when you have limited data. I think, again, it's what is your suspicion, right? A lot of those 10 to 11s couldn't, maybe they're not iron deficient, right? And so we wouldn't want to be starting iron. But of course, if the history is very, you know, suggestive, then yeah, absolutely, if there's no room to do anything more, it's a mild anemia, likely a lower dose will be probably, you know, well tolerated and could help. So I would say, you know, yeah, with limited data, absolutely lean heavily on your dietary history and then treat from there. But yeah, I think that you're, that's, that's absolutely reasonable to go with a lower kind of maintenance dose iron. Um, if they are, you know, at some point we would like to try to get some more data, right, to see because if they truly are, you know, extremely microcytic or those stores are really low, that maintenance won't really cut it. You could start the maintenance and then work on the diet, right, and then kind of do more hemoglobins from there. I think that would be my recommendation. Hi, my question's for Dr. Johnson. I'm Shannon Cohn, I'm one of the oncologists here. Uh, your talk was beautiful and, and really spoke to me in a lot of ways. Um, one comment I'd like to add before my question. I've been surprised and delighted in my experiences um, referring patients to um, state services and CPS at how it's actually possible to have a therapeutic relationship after that. Um, if you're kind to a family, if you're respectful to a family, and if you verbalize, I know that you're doing what you want to do because you care about your child. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, there is a path forward that um, I've often, well, a couple times been delighted to see. So a question I have for you, when you're called to come into a tough situation, you've never met the family, how do you introduce yourself? How do you form a positive relationship with a family? Yeah, so I agree you can also still have a positive relationship at CPS or referral. It's all about the communication, and I think some of us are better communicators than others. Um, and so, like, if we can record this for the hospital administrators of the world, the next the answer to this is I go in with my card, which has my email address on it, and I sort of say, like, my name's Dr. Johnson, and I understand, you know, that you know I've been asked, you and the, your doctors are in disagreement about what is best for your child. Um, let me tell you about myself. I run the hospice program here at St. Jude. So if you've been to, you know, depending on where the like, kid is, if you've been in the acute care clinic, you know, you've seen some of the doctors that work for me. I'm a pediatric blood and cancer doctor by training. I've looked at your child's chart just so I can understand the medical information a little bit more, but I'm not here as a doctor today. I'm here as someone who sort of works with families when, we're, when there's a conflict. Um, and so then, you know, they have my card with sort of my email. You know, some people are really, like, they're just closed off. They don't want to talk. Usually when I go um, w to see a family, I bring a friend. So if it's a religious refusal, I'll bring the chaplain from the ethics committee. Um, if it's a parent that has some mental illness, we've had previously, like, someone from psychiatry or psychology that's also been interested in ethics. Because um, I find when it's sort of tense, it's just helpful to have, like, another person to who can, like, bounce off the conversation so that it's not one-on-one. -on -one. And it doesn't sort of always work. You know, the, I mean, the mom never spoke to me again in that brain death case, you know, um, and actually believed I was involved because St. Jude wanted her child's organs. Like, it was just, you know, it was irreparable. Um, and it was just an unfortunate circumstance. But most, 
most people don't even know what ethics is, you know, which is the other sort of interesting thing. You know, I do try to have the team try to let them know or the nurse that someone is going to come talk to them. And I also lay out expectations. Like I'm a consultant. I'm going to make a recommendation, you know, like your team, you know, I'm just here to make, you know, kind of like I'm Switzerland right now. <laughs> um, I'm going to make a recommendation. It doesn't, you know, you may, and it may be something that you agree or disagree with, um, you know, but I'm, you know, going to follow along and be here for any follow-up or anything else you need. Thank you very much, all of you. Uh, I, this is for, kind of for Dr. Johnson, but then for everybody. Um, we have a, we have a, not a, a, kind of a gripe that when our patients are in the ICU for a long time, when the attendings change, uh, when the PICU attendings change, they're getting a new DNR discussion or, or new you're not a candidate for ECMO because of X, Y, or Z discussion. How do you, how do you address that? Um, and what is your, 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 um, your take on that? And how's your, is that just a Cincinnati thing or is that everywhere? <laughs> I guess I have the microphone, so I'll go first. Um, I think it can potentially be an everywhere thing. We're lucky we're a Hemonk only ICU, right? There's only three of us in the country. MD Anderson, Sloan Kettering, and St. Jude are the only pediatric specific Hemonk ICUs. Um, you know, we have a good palliative care team. We have, a, you know what I mean? We have our intensivists have a lot more experience with oncocritical care. We have an oncocritical care fellowship. If you have anyone that would be interested in that, they can come to St. Jude and do a year um, after their PICU training. I think some ICUs will assign, that have a lot of resources will assign like a primary intensivist. I feel like it's done a little more in NICUs that sort of follows the course. I think we get around it by having a strong palliative care team. Um, before the pandemic, ethics rounded weekly. Like every Friday we would show up, so we were also kind of there to like, as a little bit of continuity. When COVID happened, they were like, please don't come with your germs. Um, and we haven't quite like picked up the pace of that again. So I'll just make a brief comment because I'm a hematologist. I don't really, I'm luckily not involved in a lot of these discussions, but I, I think in our PICU, for some reason, I tend to see like six attendings there. All, there's just a lot of attendings there all the time. I, I know there's some intensivists probably in this room that can speak more to that, but in a way, you know, there's, there's um, you know, pros and cons of that, but the pros is that it just feels like there's a lot of um, sort of minds and lenses looking at that patient at one time. And so I think that even if the attending, the primary attending changes, it feels to me when I'm involved in some of these discussions that there are, there's a sort of a pulse on that patient from the whole group and there's more of a consensus so that there's not such a, like a stark you know, change in plans when an attendant comes on. Of course, there's little nuances, but um, it doesn't seem to be you know, too bad in my experience. And I agree with her. Thankfully, we don't have to do this all that often, but um, I do very much appreciate the way our ICU um, approaches it because I completely agree with her in the fact that there seems to always be more than one attending kind of present. Um, what I think is really interesting, we don't do a lot of DNR discussions, but we recently had a very complex patient who was a sickle cell patient who not only was a Jehovah Witness, but also was absolutely frightened of a blood transfusion based on a prior life experience. They thought we were gonna give this child blood and they were going to die. Um, and that was quite intense um, because it wasn't just your normal, I don't want blood. And I thought the way our team handled it was awesome and the fact that there was just constant communication between the four of us of that handoff from attending to attending from service week to service week. There was a discussion of what had been discussed at the bedside. Um, you know, and, and this particular patient was Alicia's primary, but there was a seamless communication. And I think that that ended up being a really good experience for us. The child actually ended up not needing a blood transfusion, um, but it was a great uh, example of how important communication is between providers and the way to approach a very complex situation. Yeah, I agree with both of them. Um, there's not much stagnation in our PICU, so I think some PICUs, maybe an attending takes call for you know day and night for three days straight or something, and our intensivists swap off morning and night, so there's more than one set of eyes uh, in any even 24-hour time. Um, Dr. Thompson 
is in the PICU every single day, I think, all the time. Um, and then I think also the primary team being there uh, and there being little turnover. So I know at least one of the giant hospitals um, in our state, um, when kids go to the PICU, I think no matter whether it's solid tumor, leukemia, or transplant, there's like a separate um, ICU oncology team, ICU hemonc team, and the patient's primary attending might not be on that service, and it might be someone who never even took care of the patient when they weren't in the ICU. And so I think that's one way that that can be improved is like the primary team being heavily involved when they're in the ICU. I'm a gynecologist. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm the newest member of the team, so <laughs> I don't have a whole lot. But luckily, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I've been here for about six months or so. And I mean, I totally agree with all the comments that, that have been made thus far. I mean, it seems to be rather, and I trained at Cincinnati, so Chris, I completely relate to you. I mean, there are times when, um, you know, the, the teams, when it changes, uh, uh, there could be gas. But somehow, uh, at least thus far, it seems to have really Really worked out well and I think for all those reasons that we're not large enough large enough to have so many different teams at the same time but at the same time I think we're small enough with all hands on the deck at, um, including the primary team being involved that it seems to work out really well. <laughs>